And member David Bobanik, uh, whose classification is Human and Community Services, will introduce Angela and member Laurie Hennessy, classification of education, will guide the conversation during Angela's presentation. And if you ladies would like to come up, David, the podium is yours. Thanks, Jimmy. Good afternoon, everybody. Good to see you all here and in person. This is wonderful. Um, and I, I'm thrilled with the honor of getting to, to introduce today's program. Angela Dunleavy is an accomplished senior executive and entrepreneur with over 20 years of experience in consumer retail sector and deep knowledge of social entrepreneurship and nonprofit management. Angela is CEO of Fair Start, which is a James Beard award-winning nonprofit organization that transforms lives, disrupts poverty, and nourishes communities through food, life skills, and job training. As, as an aside, I think as a Seattleite, we are so fortunate to have this community resource uh, leading the way in our community. For nearly 30 years, Fair Start has provided hands-on training to students through its social entrepreneurship cafes, restaurants, and catering business while providing wraparound social services. And when COVID struck in March of 2020, Angela led the Fair Start team through a pivot to provide thousands of vulnerable neighbors meals in the wake of the crisis, delivering more than 3 million meals throughout the Seattle area. Our organist, yes. So our organization, Harvest Against Hunger, partners with Fair Start to our Farm to Community program. Uh, it creates a much needed marketplace for cash strapped local farmers and a source for healthy produce for those in need. Angela, your staff has been just phenomenal to partner with on that program. Thank you. Prior to her start, or her role at Fair Start, Angela was co-founder and CEO of Ethan Stoll Restaurants, a Seattle-based hospitality group. Angela was named to Puget Sound Business Journal's 40 Under 40 Hall of Fame, honored as one of Puget Sound Business Journal's Women of Influence, named one of the 50 most influential women in Seattle by Seattle Met Magazine, and recognized as one of YWCA's Women Who Dare. So I think we're sensing a bit of a trend here. <laughs> Today, Angela will be interviewed by Laura Hen Lori Hennessy, Rotarian and CEO of League of Education Voters. Lori has spent 30 years in government, public relations, politics, and nonprofits, but her secret is that she began her career as a radio reporter at Cairo here in Seattle and still remembers that job fondly. Lori's thrilled to hearken back to her roots and interview Angela for us today. Lori calls Angela deeply inspiring, and we're fortunate that Lori recommended this club for our program. So here with a woman-to-woman -woman chat, Lori Hennessy and Angela Dunleavy. Thank you. All right, now that I have a for giving it up. Can you hear me? So I just want to be really clear, doing a one -on -one in the same room as Mark Wright, not advisable, very, very difficult. And I have a spotty mic. <laughs> Ken, you're so great. Hello. All right, we're back. Hello, Angela. Hello, it's nice to be here. It's really wonderful to be in a room full of people. I'm <laughs> being safe, COVID safe, of course. It's kind of a surreal feeling looking out at people. It's my, fir my first in-person event. That's great. <laughs> I think it's mine too. Um, all right, so let's start at the top. You grew up in a little town, Baker City, Oregon. How does your rural Oregon background and your time in the food service industry contribute to the person you are today? Uh, it, you know, this is, I love talking about this. Um, and I love talking about it because for the first, I don't know, 20 years I lived in Seattle, I tried to keep it a really deep secret that I came from this small town in Eastern Oregon. Um, and in part, it was because, you know, it was a logging town. It was a, a mill working town. It, and I came from a family that 
while well-meaning, um, were fairly dysfunctional, and um, no one in my family had gone to college, and it wasn't necessarily a situation in which I had, you know, parents who didn't go to college, but they really wanted that for their children. Like, it was, it just wasn't a priority in my family, but it was a priority to me, um, and it was a priority for me to also get out of that small town. My mom was a teen mother. Uh, I had siblings who were teen parents. I saw, you know, the the trappings that happen uh, in small kind of, you know, underrepresented rural communities. And I got out um, by starting at 15 years old, um, scooping ice cream at Charlie's Ice Cream Shop. If any of you drive through Eastern Oregon and go through Baker City, you can still stop at Charlie's Ice Cream Shop. Um, and I, you know, from there I worked a host of um, restaurant jobs. Uh, eventually left that small town uh, and made my way to Seattle, where I eventually established residency, waited tables, and spent eight years getting my undergrad, um, first at Nor by going to North Seattle Community College and then University of Washington. Um, and I just am grateful for the life skills I think that I learned working in restaurants or how to really hustle, you know, I think part of my upbringing just gave me um, a little bit of grit that you need for one to work in restaurants. But, and so now I'm at Fair Start and it's really kind of taking me full circle and being able to give a fresh start um, to individuals through a sector that gave me a fresh start in a way. Mm -hmm. So it's really fulfilling. So let's talk a bit about COVID. Um, as you and I have talked about, I was so impressed with how Fair Start just quickly um, embraced this difficult chapter in our city's history by being creative. You were very um, focused on getting your messaging out there, reaching out to people, letting people know you were available. A lot of the things you did were innovative in a time where a lot of people just wanted to hunker down and survive. What was going through your head as you all stepped forward during the first months after COVID? Well, I think for those of you who are in the room, um, our leaders or business people or, or have employees, my number one thought was, I can't let my staff go without paychecks. And as a single mom, I can't go without a paycheck myself. And so I really, in the first weeks, thought, okay, what do we have to do to get to June? Because in my mind, we were going to be through this by June, um, which now is is just sobering to think about. So uh, what we needed to do, you know, close down the restaurants, close down the cafes, um, shutter catering. But what Fair Start has been doing for 30 years that goes kind of silently uh, celebrated is meals to the community. So prior to COVID, we uh, produce rough, we were producing uh, roughly 950,000 meals a year to uh, local shelters, healthcare centers, childcare centers. And what COVID really pushed us to do was really go back to our roots and who we were and how we started. And, and Fair Start, you know, began in the late 80s with the young chef who was preparing meals uh, in the basement of a church on Capitol Hill. And, you know, eventually that became a training program so that the individuals he was serving could, could uh, receive job training. And so going back to that really allowed us to um, get laser focused on the needs of the community, which were at that time and still are hunger relief um, for individuals who couldn't leave their buildings. So uh, we worked really deeply with DESC and Plymouth to get meals to those who are living in permanent supportive housing. Um, really amazing uh, benefits that we've seen health benefits, you know, aside from COVID that we can talk about, but it just really gave us this, this new purpose of not only meeting people where they are in, in need of job training, um, because we were, you know, working with our graduates and our students to try to get them into jobs after they'd been laid off and how do we continue training in a virtual setting, but it also allowed us to feed the community in a quite literal way. Um, and so addressing, you know, both ends of the poverty spectrum of, of hunger relief and then, you know, the need for economic security through jobs. And while this is all happening, we also have a pandemic. So mental health challenges, um, you have kids, you're juggling everything. How do you model that as a nonprofit leader in town in terms of having a life, trying to do things besides your job, but live a life of purpose as a mom and as a woman leader too. What do you do for your staff? 
Well, I think that the last year with the double pandemic, COVID, and then the racial justice movement of last summer provided much needed conversations around mental health. Uh, really, you know, the vulnerability to have hard conversations, both at work and at home, um, were some of the ways that I think we, I needed to model as a mother and as a leader, um, the challenges that we were all going through. And there were some really vulnerable times. And, you know, we had an all hands uh, meeting three days after the George Floyd murder. And I don't think there was a dry eye on the call when we, when we got off. And, and I think that what we've allowed at Fair Start and what I allow with my own kids is just the space to feel, the space to be vulnerable, and the space to acknowledge that we're not always all okay. And I think, you know, when you're in social services, and a lot of people think about Fair Start as like, oh, you're that great restaurant that provides, you know, training. But we provide a an incredible number of social services and behavioral health supports to our graduates. And, you know, we lost four students last year to overdose. You know, we lost uh, a graduate uh, three days ago to COVID. You know, so there's been a lot of loss within our own Fair Start community. And I think that um, we just really, you know, taking the time to offer people time off for mental health supports, to take them myself, you know, to to encourage my kids to, you know, who are nine and seven to talk to their school counselor. And I just think that, you know, we're seeing this with Simone Biles in the last day, actually normalizing and talking about the need to take care of our mental health has been so critical to me and my staff in the last year. So really just creating space and honoring that as a need that we need to be a lot better about as leaders in the community and employers in the community. You know, we all read about how Seattle has come back from um, the difficult year and a half, even though as of like yesterday, we might still be in the difficult year and a half. Your notes are old. Your notes are old. <laughs> yeah. Get rid of these notes, people. Um, yeah. I mean, we all talk about how difficult it has been. And there seems to be a feeling that part of the society around us is doing fantastically well. Um, people in the tech world are doing fantastically well. You know, I, my best friend's son was going into tech and he had like 10 offers and was choosing amongst them all. And I'm going, because in the nonprofit world, it, it feels a little different than that. Um, tell us about the world that you see in terms of food security, in terms of the part of Seattle that we might not see as much. It, where is that part of Seattle? Is it still a challenge for people? Oh, it's a bigger challenge now than ever before. So um, I spend a lot of my time now working on advocacy-related issues to help alleviate uh, poverty and homelessness. And one of the things that I think we really need to contend with both at the local and federal level is the benefits clip that it's not new. Um, but that is exasperated um, now with the cost of living in Seattle. And so um, I'll give you a couple of facts. If you are a single parent with a, an, an infant, you need to make $35 an hour to live in King County. That's not Seattle, that's King County. If you have a toddler and an infant, you need to make $48 an hour. And so one of the challenges that I see for the retail sector, for hospitality sector, for the work that we train individuals to work in who have barriers to employment, is what do they do when your 20 hour, you know, your $20 an hour job causes you to lose your federal benefits, but you don't make that $35 an hour that you need to support your family. And so I think that we're going to continue to see these inequities exist in our region until we have both a public and private solution to poverty. And when we finally decide we're going to help people before they are completely destitute, and when we finally decide we're going to help people who are, you know, we might not feel like we have anything in common with because we couldn't imagine not showering for two weeks, living, you know, under a bridge, you know, having debilitating mental health um, issues that they're contending with, but they still need our help and we still need to show up. And it doesn't just happen through, you know, passing legislation here in Seattle. It, I mean, we really need to be talking to our federal government right now about how to do this. And that's a whole, I mean, I can, we can have a whole separate conversation about that. But that's where I think that we're not in a great spot. Like, I, I wish I had happier things to say about where we are with our job market, but I think it's going to be really hard for a lot of people. So many of us here in the room in the last 
year have been talking a lot about racial equity and so many leaders are trying to address that in new ways in the workplace, both in terms of their practices, how, how they talk, how they listen. What are some of the things that you're doing at Fair Start? Well, this is, um, this is something that I'm really proud of that we've done at Fair Start. So when I joined Fair Start in 2018, uh, within a month, we had hired our first uh, racial equity consultants. And six months later in mid-2019, we wrote our new strategic plan. And in that plan, we wrote in a race equity um, uh, component uh, that we really wanted to have that diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging um, embedded into the DNA of, of Fair Start. And so in early 2020, just before the pandemic hit, we hired our first ever chief um, people and inclusion officer, wonderful professional um, who has deep experience and lived experience in some of the issues that Fair Start works in. And we've been able to create this real culture within Fair Start that values um, not only race equity, but anti-racism. Um, we've adopted an anti-racist statement that our board unanimously um, voted for. Uh, we have over half of our staff um, taking part in race equity uh, work groups. About a third of our workforce are active in those work groups. Um, and, you know, we really are making decisions from top to bottom with that race equity lens. And I think that the most obvious way that you all will see it from the public is really changing the way that we're approaching our work. Uh, you know, I had a conversation just this morning with someone who said, all of these restaurants need workers. Can't Fair Start be this great pipeline? And my response was, sure, we could be, but let's talk about the environments in the sector that we're putting individuals in. And is that where we want to be right now? Do we need to have, you know, the sector's going through a bit of a reckoning, and I understand that. But I also understand the disparate racial disparities that exist in, in the restaurant and food service. And so really, you know, having our students and our graduates lead where they want to be working and many of them, they want the union jobs at a, at a grocer, you know, they want to work for, you know, a, a company like Starbucks so they can get that free education credit. And I think that what we're really doing is, is taking that deep commitment to race equity and gender equity and really listening. Uh, to community, listening to our graduates, and then changing um, our programming um, to be responsive to that. So looking far out as we move into post-pandemic life, what are some of the things that people here might be most excited about that you're doing at Fair Start? Well, I think that one of the things that I am really excited about is the kind of shift that we're taking in how we are serving uh, the individuals who come into our program. So it's no longer enough for us just to bring uh, you know, individuals uh, from incarceration or from homelessness and to train them to work in restaurants. We know that for a lot of folks, that's a great first, you know, first low barrier job. Um, but what we're really focusing on are our pathways and how can we get our graduates connected with higher education, with certificates, with apprenticeship that may not have anything to do with food service. And how do we use all of those really um, amazing tools and skills uh, to help individuals you know, on that pathway. And then how do we, you know, really train people to work in, uh, understand, um, you know, technical literacy, you know, financial literacy. And so you'll see us doing that kind of work in the community. Don't worry, the Fair Start restaurant will come back for lunch. Um, but we are putting a deeper focus on who we're, who we're feeding and who we really want to serve are the people who are farthest from opportunity. So you will see us really doubling our efforts in hunger relief and food security and, and really taking a double prong approach to addressing poverty. And as you mentioned, we uh, have served over 3 million meals since the pandemic began and we don't plan on slowing down. So what do people here do? Oh, yeah, pause. <laughs> what do people here do if they want to support your mission? What's the most helpful thing for them to do? You're all going to be shocked when I say money. <laughs> What a surprise question that was. <laughs> um, no, I mean, you know, obviously financial contributions are the, you know, the best way for most people to, to support our organization. Um, but time as well, we're, you know, we're starting to bring volunteers back into our building. You can go to our website um, and, you know, learn more about volunteer opportunities. But really, I think that the thing that I would, there are two things that I would say. One is 
change the mindset from charity to community investment. So really that's what we're looking to do is invest in communities, support communities, build communities, um, and, and really taking from a, a charity mindset to an investment mindset. Um, and so when you uh, invest your dollars into the community, maybe, maybe taking that shift. And then I think secondarily is you know, I, I don't probably don't need to tell this group to get civically involved. There are so many issues that we can solve right now with the current administration in Washington, uh, with a real desire for social change. Um, there are things that we can do here in Seattle and in Washington state to address some of the issues that I talked about with benefits cliff. So that's where I'm going to be spending a lot of my time. So don't be surprised if I come and knock on your doors to like help me advocate for this at, at, in Olympia. So one last question. Um, we talked about this as a chat, a, a, a chat between two women or a fireside chat. Uh, how do women help each other? But, you know, like when you've advised me or given me advice about being in the nonprofit world, I mean, it feels like it's, it's um, a great need for women to help those who are coming up behind us. Do you try to do that a lot? Do you try to be there when people reach out like that? Oh, absolutely. Um, I think one of my you know, one of my biggest motivations is to help people kind of move to that next level. And um, I have a, an amazing executive assistant who I'm really sad to lose, but really excited she's getting a promotion uh, within Fair Start. Um, but, you know, I, I think that what I think, when I think about women in leadership, you know, it's really easy it, it's not really easy. It's easier for women who look like us, who, who are white women, to find um, uh, leadership positions. I think that it's really um, on us to help, um, you know, women in the BIPOC community get that same, uh, you know, access. And that's by amplifying their voices and, you know, inviting them into the same rooms that we're getting invited to. Um, but I also think that as a mom and a leader, I still think that while there may not be the we the glass ceiling you know we we're getting we're bumping the glass ceiling externally but i do think that there is still a lot of internal strife that female leaders face and you know t to i have i have you know i can't i got to figure out a way to get my kids from camp and to camp two days this week and i have spent every single day thinking about like man i'm such a bad mom that i can't pick my kids up from camp and you know no offense to the men out here. I bet you don't sweat it if you don't pick your kids up from camp. And so I think that what I tell female leaders is like, we need to start recognizing that we belong in these same rooms. And sometimes it means that our kids aren't going to get picked up from camp or you're going to miss that one really important thing. And the thing that I always think, you know, I have two boys. And so I think, you know, if I miss something that was really important to them, I hope they know it's because, you know, my mom was out being a CEO somewhere uh, and doing important work. But I think that the pressure that for women, it comes from women a lot of times um, that I see. And so as much as I can help be the, you know, the wind at someone's back, I, I want to do that. So if you need your kids picked up from camp, I'm happy to help you if I have a day free. <laughs> she has it down now. Um, I think we have time for a question or two. So Sarah's gonna, oh, there you go. anyone have any question? Not so much a question, uh, compliments. In the years past, you would have events and you'd invite chefs from other organizations. Two things that came out of one, it just broadcast who you are and what you are. Because people recognize who those chefs are. I just wanna compliment you on that. Superb. Thank you. As a regular volunteer at Guest Chef Night for many years. So I may ask if it's coming back at some point. We, that, that is the, the $50 million question. We will reopen the uh, Fair Start Restaurant sometime in 2022, hopefully early in the year. We wanted to, uh, one, be mindful of the restaurateurs around our neighborhood who Want, who are really trying to, to re, rebuild. And then also we are using that space for our hunger relief efforts. So we're working on moving to a larger space so that we can reclaim some of our dining room. If you were to walk by, it's full of boxes right now. Um, so we will, Guest Chef will be some version of itself. Um, in the meantime, I think September 9th, uh, we're doing a Guest Chef at Home, which is a virtual event you can sign up for. I think we're uh, making pizza with modernist cuisine in September. So that will be a fun fun event to, to tune into. And today, uh, quick question. When you started off, you had talked a little bit about your 
upbringing in Eastern Oregon. And so my question is, is what motivated you to do what you're doing today, given the fact that your parents weren't supportive of higher education and things like that? Yeah, I think that for me, I, well, my career took a lot of different turns. Um, I, uh, I got a lot of interesting opportunities because I was at the right time in the right place. And then as I grew my career as a restaurateur in Seattle, I realized that I had an opportunity to, you know, kind of take the, the Russell Wilson way of the, why not you, why not you make sure that someone else is getting a leg up. And, um, I, you know, after the recession, which was brutally hard for a 30 some year old, you know, couple of 30 some year old startup restaurateurs with every max credit card, just making it through that sort of put a fire in me to be able to give back to the community in a more meaningful way than just restaurants. And so for me, that's really what drew me to nonprofit work. And, um, and I think that, you know, that lack of access and opportunity is not lost on me because I, I was able to kind of muscle my way through it, elbow my way through it. it. You know, as a, as a white woman, it's a whole lot easier to go out and wait tables and we can talk about all the rights and wrongs of that. But, you know, it, it just there, it, it has laid bare to me that there are massive inequities that I did not face growing up. A poor white girl from Eastern Oregon is a lot different than, you know, growing up a poor black or brown girl from the same area. And so that really drives me right now to do the work that I do. I thank you for your comments. You are truly extraordinary. Uh, there was recently a high profile case in Seattle regarding uh, sexual harassment in the restaurant industry, which I'm to understand happens more than we realized. I was wondering if Fair Start is participating in that conversation at all. Thanks. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's been a really hard that was a really hard story. Um, the stories that came out in New York three or four years ago were really hard as well in New Orleans and LA. And so it's not really, um, I wish I was surprised uh, as a woman in the industry. Um, you know, this, I think for a long time we've said, you know, this just happens. This is the way that it is. And I think that we're at a point where we're saying that's enough. Um, I was recently sharing with my board, um, uh, that I was really, I, I had a braggadocious moment that we had a, um, a sous chef that had recently been hired at Fair Start that walked out on the second day. Uh, and I had this look of shock, which you're all probably wondering, like, why would you be happy that someone walked out on their second day of work? And it's because we have taken such a hard line that says sexual harassment, derogatory comments, it just won't stand in our rest, in our kitchens. And he got called out like four times in one day. And he was like, not my place. And so, right. Thank you. I, that's how I felt. And so I think that, um, you know, talk about women in leadership, more female chefs, more women in the kitchen. It's, there's a big toxic masculinity problem in many, many sectors in, in our economy. And, um, the back of the house kitchens are, are not short on it. Thank you for the good work you're doing at Fair Start. It's wonderful. Uh, I've enjoyed your restaurant, the one downtown, a lot over the years. But uh, I've always wondered, does it make any money for you? No. <laughs> That's the very short answer. Um, no, it doesn't. Most restaurants don't make money. Look, this is the way that I look at the Fair Start restaurant. And, and you'll see it come back in a little bit of a different way. One of the things that I'm really excited to do that sort of has mind boggled me that we've never done is have our students working in the front of the house. So we would have students working in the back of the house, which by the way, is the lower paying part of the restaurant, um, but never learning to be servers or, you know, hosts. So when we come back, you will see um, our students working in the front of the house. Um, and so if we can, if we can treat our restaurant like a classroom, um, and it's the, you know, the loss on that restaurant is the cost of, of bringing someone from a tent to a shelter to permanent housing. Uh, that's a, that's a win for me. So we really look at the triple bottom line and our double bottom line, depending on how many things you're, you know, uh, tracking, but yeah, no restaurants, restaurants don't make money period. Like, so if any of you are thinking about like, I want to start a restaurant, 
come talk to me first. Well, uh, Jeff Borek, thanks for being here today. And I hate to give you another opportunity to lose money, but I was about to give you a plug for holiday dining experiences. My employer, IBM, has regularly used a fair start in December and also in January when it's not so busy. So if you're thinking of a group gathering for your company, it's a great place to go. Question for you, please. Um, you've worked for some restaurant organizations that have strong personalities. Uh, the chef uh, that's quasi-celebrity. Uh, the recent tragedy about the Anthony Bourdain and his loss. Do you have any insight as to the how mental health fix, or fits into the restaurant industry different from other industries? Uh, I think alcohol and drugs, honestly. Um, you know, this, it's, it's hard. It's hard because a lot of people go into restaurants for all the wonderful things that restaurants are. It's a place where you might not feel like you fit in anywhere else and you can find your people. You will find people who have a PhD working in the front of the house. You will find a high school dropout working in the back of the house. And at the end of the day, you'll see them all sit down and have dinner together. I think the one thing that does kind of resoundingly fit into restaurants is that it is, it is a place where you can go and spend a lot of late nights um, drinking and doing other things. And, you know, when we start looking at why we do that um, at restaurants or, or not, uh, you know, a lot of times we're, you know, alcoholism and addiction is uh, medicating mental health issues. So not surprising that we've got individuals who are working in an environment that have easy access to medication uh, who are, who are having that problem. But I also think that for every person who might suffer from a mental health condition in a restaurant, the same number of people are suffering from mental health in a white collar industry. Well, I get the last question. Of I course guess. you do. <laughs> Thank you, Angela. A uh, fair start is so important to our community and just love it. But one of the things that I would like to ask is to go back to what you were starting to talk about, and that is the, the COVID situation, how you got through this from a financial standpoint. Uh, uh, you were able to feed others. Um, it's really an expensive thing to do. How did you do this? It was wild, I will tell you. Um, so All in Seattle, I think, really helped kick us off with a, a tremendous amount of support. Um, you know, I started penciling some in some numbers and the number of people that we wanted to do and, and presented the budget to my board chair. And she said, you are insane. What are you doing to this organization? This is $16 million. And I said, I know. Uh, and what's the other option? And so we just hustled. I mean, we hustled. And um, I think that the All in Seattle was, you know, tremendously helpful in getting that ball rolling. Um, we worked really, really hard to get government contracts and government funding. Um, and, you know, we have just an amazing team that put on this wonderful virtual event that raised $1.8 million. And we got some coverage in the New York Times with Nicholas Kristof. And we ended up raising $17.2 million last year, um, which was, it felt really, really good. Um, but really, it's it's telling the story. It's being authentic. It's do you know? It's being relevant in COVID, um, which you know, and and being now relevant after with with hunger relief and really meeting the needs and helping people understand what the needs are. And that's what we've really worked to do. Well, I just wanted to say that um, for many of us in the last year and a half, the way we have got through is to find inspiration, um, and you have inspired me. So I'm very grateful to have you come here, Angela. Thank you.